part of the story of physiology and anatomy is not only the structure, but it has some people unique qualities of wildlife to exist. So we'll talk about that, moving to translocation and things like that. So you'll find that the reading material, especially in the law and the book text, is very deep and uh, complex. Most of those points they're going to go through will have gone through in various parts of the class while it was a good semester. So what I'm trying to indicate here is don't try and read every little word from the book. Um, this chapter on transport especially because there's a lot of detail in there. I will cover some of it, but most of it will pick up in various other sections like um, in the GI system and, and kidney and so forth. I'm talk about transport in more detail. So focus on the notes and learn it at the level that the notes have which is more than sufficient. And one other comment before I get started, and that is, I told you, I warned you of this uh, Tuesday, I changed the notes tremendously, so uh, if you downloaded the notes before this morning, unfortunately, uh, they're quite a bit different now on Blackboard, so anyway, uh, you probably want to download the new version, and I said before, I promise not to do that after the lecture. That's about as far as I can ever seem to get. Okay, so that's the page numbers on boron and bulky, but the uh, chapter two is the structure of membranes and chapter five is on membrane transport. Uh, you see there's uh, pages missing uh, from both of those, especially the second one. And as I said before, there's far more detail than I do in the book, but uh, definitely a lot of good information. Okay, so let's get started. So, the cell membrane um, compartmentalizes the cell in many different ways. One way is it separates the cell from the external environment and makes it unique, but it also compartmentalizes you know, organelles within the cell such that organelles have very distinctive uh, concentrations of electrolytes and, and other constituents. So uh, one of its principal functions, just like walls of a home, are to divide up the the environment, and that's because the membrane is selectively permeable, which just simply means it allows passage of some constituents across it and doesn't allow others. It also has very specific and very interesting <coughs> and complex translocation systems, actual uh, machines that move substances very specifically across its barrier. So it's very complex and have life without these amazing capacities. The membrane has as part of its structure uh, some elements of proteins that couple to very specific uh, signaling molecules. We call them ligands. So these are molecules such as hormones and neurotransmitters that couple to these proteins and alter intracellular function. So that's another really important function of membranes. Uh, not only is the plasma membrane that surrounds the cell um, have this type of character, but so does the nuclear envelope and all the membranes surrounding organelles such as lysosomes and mitochondria. Uh, there's a tremendous difference between each of these membranes, but they all have this basic structural um, system that plasma membranes do. Uh, especially when you're thinking about uh, nervous system, the, one of the very critical functions of cell membranes is a conduit for information exchange. So we'll talk about uh, in the next couple of weeks, resting membrane potential, the action potential on top of membranes is capable of this type of activity and how it uses it as a very rapid me method of information exchange. So what I adopted to do over the past couple of years is do this historically, but it's just kind of a nice way to tie together very quickly what the membrane's composition is. So back in 1956, which isn't that far back in my lifetime, well, maybe for yours, uh, a couple of investigators called Das and Belly proposed what we call the unit membrane concept, which was really our first, uh, and this is, you know, 50 years ago, so that's much longer but it was our first concept of what the membrane was based on. And it was really based on biochemical information, chemical information about what the membrane is composed of. 
and they proposed, based on chemical studies and also uh, microscopy, which was developing very rapidly at this time, that the membrane, first of all, was primarily composed of fossil lipids. Secondly, it was a double membrane, a bilayer, if you will. There were proteins believed in the membrane that they imagined or pictured these to be absorbed on the surface of the lipids and uh, called the whole structure a unit membrane. And the term unit membrane came from the concept that, just like I was talking about, that the plasma membrane, the uh, uh, membrane surrounding the nucleus, the uh, membrane surrounding mitochondria, and on and on, and membranes from different organisms, be it protozoan or uh, elephant, have very similar uh, constituencies. So we call it a unit membrane, meaning membranes across our biological universe look like this. And this is one of the first electron micrographs of the idea. And you can see this is actually not a uh, bilayer. Each of these is a bilayer. In other words, this is a cell here. You can see the ER. This is another cell here. You can see a mitochondria. And between the two are the plasma membranes of both cells. So this, if you can look in more detail, is a bilayer here and a bilayer here. And that's what they first kind of very gross uh, explanation of our first understanding of what a membrane is composed of. The lipids themselves uh, were primarily phospholipids. The term amphiphilic means that they have both lipophilic and hydrophilic uh, composition. In other words, they are both polar and nonpolar. They have both types of structure. And the, the polar structure is basically this uh, head group, which is composed in this case of a phospholipid, this polar, and ethanolamine. This, of course, is phosphatidylethanolamine. But there are more classes of phospholipid and so forth and other molecules, but most molecules of the membrane are definitely uh, amphiphilic. And they have polar groups, as is shown here on one side of the molecule, and then the other pole, if you will, of the molecule is often fatty acids that are classically non. So this amphiphilic nature is really what gives the bilayer its fall. If you add some phospholipids to a polar medium such as water, they will orient, as you see here in this figure, they will kind of lay on the surface with the polar parts, which are uh, the head groups that we just talked about, the phosphate and ethanol. I mean, in, this, in a previous example, align with water and then fatty acids and trying to escape. So, this is classic phospholipids in the water. If you pour oil on water, you see the same kind of thing. It being not hydrophilic. Phospholipids form a surface coat if you add them to a solution, or if you stir the solution or set up a right ionic constituency ionic strength, you can get these uh, uh, phospholipids to form little balls, which you call micelles. And the same thing applies to my cell, it applies to a layer of phospholipids on a solution. And that is the polar groups will try and affiliate with water and the non-polar hydrogen water. And so you get this type of organization of a my cell. If you really um, exert some effort, it's possible to form bilayers artificially. And we've done this for many years. And then with an artificially uh, produced bilayer, and you can do it by using a variety of phospholipids, you can study the characteristics of the backbone of the membrane without the protein complement. So we paint, is the way we usually do it, literally with a little brush, uh, a mixture of phospholipids across a small orifice between two aquatic media and actually form a bilayer in the middle of two uh, pools of water, whatever. You put salt solution on the sun, and then study transport characteristics across the bilayer. Much of what we know about you know, membrane transport comes from studies like that. I think even these days putting proteins into the proteins you want to study. Um, the phospholipid bilayer is ideally suited for what it's doing, of course, biologically, and that is it forms a barrier across the uh, between two compartments, as we said, it compartmentalizes itself, and that bilayer is largely impermeant to uh, polar 
sudden, and it's been quite permeable gun for sudden. And so things that are charged, which most of our biologically important molecules are, cannot cross that barrier. But very, very small molecules uh, and uncharged molecules can go across this bioweapon. Tremendous variability and permeability across artificial bilayers and as well as real bilayers. It depends on constituency. Uh, if you have uh, 403 or cell biology, you go into different structures of membranes and how much that's permeability with some membranes, you can mostly periodic membranes are rich in cholesterol, and there's other constituents that affect the permeability of bilayers. So bilayers don't all have the same permeability characteristics, but generally they're very close. Okay, so that was our first step, the Bass and Ginelli concept of the human membrane. Around 20 years later in the 70s, uh, the next huge development occurred with Singer and Nicholson's work. And this came first from the idea that there wasn't really enough protein affiliated with a membrane to coat each surface. Bass and Ginelli thought both surfaces had a coat of protein on them, and we got more and more information from a lot of studies, such as uh, electron micrographs and other studies that indicated that there wasn't that much protein affiliated. And then Singer and Nicholson proposed what they call the fluid mosaic model, that the proteins were affiliated with the membrane sort of like items floating on a sea. They called the fluid mosaic model. And from chemical studies, they realized some of these proteins were tightly affiliated and some weren't. And so we started the discussion about proteins being integral or peripheral. Uh, an integral protein was one that usually went right through the matrix of the bilayer. In other words, it could not be removed by simple means. It was covalently linked somehow into the membrane structure. Or in contrast, very easily, the very simple chemical procedures one family of proteins could be removed from, um, from membranes. Some of these can be as simple as changing the pH or the ionic constituents, the ionic the strength of the solution. So uh, we started separating proteins very early into families, whether they're integral or peripheral. Uh, then, from then on, we started becoming very good at studying chemistry of membranes and learning just how these proteins were affiliated with with uh, the membrane structure, which became very, very useful in later knowing what all these proteins did. So it, it became very evident early that the integral proteins, in most cases, went right through the bilayer itself. They were transmembrane, and most of these transmembrane proteins, we started doing amino acid analysis, the parts that went right through the backbone of the membrane were hydrophobic amino acids. And so uh, we certainly, look, certainly we could look at the amino acid sequence of membrane protein and figure out what was the membrane spanning portion. So anyway, progress started moving very quickly on actually figuring out the structure of these membrane proteins. Some of these are almost good fraction of them are helical proteins that go right through the, the, the membrane. Many of them are multi -path. In other words, rather than a single pass through the membrane as it be here, many, many, especially the transport proteins are multi-pass on um, groups of seven or eight passes, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. And then some of them don't even go all the way through the membrane, but the portions they do are out the human and other class are called beta barrels. But anyway, what essentially we're trying to say is there's a very distinct structure of the membrane spanning portion. And these, all of these types of proteins called integral. There's some much smaller group of proteins called integral that are covalently linked to perhaps part of the phospholipid structure as is indicated here, or a little second I'm going to talk about in a second. So these don't come off simply by the chemical means that we also call these integral, even though they weren't part of the basic uh, membrane itself. But and this is a pretty less important uh, group of uh, proteins and you'll probably get in your mind later on the integral proteins are part of the span of these will have to do the membrane structure. Peripheral proteins in contrast are shown here in blue on the left. 
non-covalently bonded as a rule to the integral protein. So they're very easy to remove and play an interesting role due to this nature. And this book, extracellular and intracellular uh, peripheral proteins, and they have very distinct roles in memory function. Most of them have which means rather than having uh, long complex structures, they form a very tight globular array. Another interesting characteristic of uh, proteins coding with membranes, and Singer Nicholson in the 70s even realized this, and that's why they call it uh, proteins floating on a sea of lipids, is that these proteins can move around on the membrane. In fact, we tag them with fluorescent dyes and other markers, and we can actually photograph them in time moving around the membrane. So another characteristic of membrane proteins is they have lateral mobility, except that there is limits to that. And the first limit is, and I'm going to go into this figure in a couple of lectures, is that they're limited by the linkage or uh, type of junctions there is between cells. And the most limiting one is what we call type junctions, and we're going to talk about this in a couple of lectures. But uh, epithelia, this is cells that are non, that have polarity in their function because of that polarity characteristic. But epithelia form boundaries between two carbons. So Define all this and get to this problem. But because of this, they're hooked together tightly, and uh, membrane proteins can't pass those boundaries, which really is important. In other words, you can have a family of proteins that are unique to the apical side of the cell, and another family of proteins that are unique to what we call the basal lateral side of the cell, the basal membrane side of the cell. So you can have two distinct families of proteins, and that's interesting and important because. Each of these does something different. Like you could have unidirectional movement of subgroup from the across the gastrointestinal mucosa. You can have a group of uh, uh, proteins on the apical side that will absorb the material into the cell, and another whole different cluster of proteins on the basal lateral that will end up transporting it out into the blood. So it's important to have different families of proteins in different sides of the polar organ itself. And that's what, even though they have mobility. They don't have lateral mobility across these two compartments of membrane. And in fact, we, when we synthesize the proteins within the um, ER and Golgi, they are addressed and go specifically to the right side of the cell, part of the really cool stuff we do in our cells. So anyway, that's a little point that's very important that uh, membranes are combined, membrane proteins are combined to different domains. Another way, besides tight junctions, that we uh, confine uh, membrane proteins to areas is what we call protein tethering. So some of the proteins that are in the membrane are coupled together by uh, some of their parts to either an extracellular um, structure or an intracellular structure. In other words, they're locked in position and hooked together by essentially ropes, like boats docked in a dock, in other words, they're hooked up to something either extracellular or intracellular to keep them in clusters. And we'll probably have the opportunity to talk about protein tether in a little bit. You'll hear a lot more about it if you take it on that So that's a little bit about the structure of the membrane and the function of component proteins in that structure. What do proteins do? Well, they are really, we call them a bunch of components, but Remember, the, the actual wire there itself is critical because it's, it's, it's the wall of the home, the, the uh, proteins of switches and doorways and everything else. But the, the uh, bilayer is the wall. It's, it's that barrier. But all the little functional elements are really dependent on what these proteins are. And so it's a nice introduction, and we're going to hear about this many times in the class. We go through generally what these different protein families are doing. And this is a really basic figure, but it kind of begins to tell a story. Uh, we're going to talk today, hopefully as much as we can, about translocation. And that's one of the very critical things that these proteins do. And translocation is a fancy word, just means taking stuff from one side to another. And so one of the very important roles of proteins is, is regulating what goes in and out of cells and the organelles. And there's all kinds of these translocators. Some of them are specific carriers, we're going to define in more detail. Some of them are channels, and some of them are pores. This is just a 
overall description of what we mean by a carrier, but we're going to define these three terms in just a second. Another family of proteins are enzymes, and you've all had you have chemistry, way too much chemistry in this program. I try to keep getting rid of it, but can't figure out how. But anyway, all of you essentially are chemists by the time you get through a biology program. But you definitely know what an enzyme is. It speeds up reactions, and many reactions would not occur at all without the imposition of enzymes. So enzymes are molecules that don't directly uh, part of the chemical pathway, but they are needed to orient molecules and so forth, such that the um, reaction occurs. And many of these are fixed in position in the membranes. For example, probably know the mitochondria uh, have those crispy the shells within them, and they hold enzymes in arrays within them. So it's very important that enzymes be put into these compartments in certain specific manner, and so they are uh, most times fixed within all of their some type of uh, enzyme, most of them are fixed in position by membrane. Another role of um, these proteins is receptors, and we have all types of receptors in our membranes that are very specific, called ligands, and that general term just means that they that's the molecule that binds to a receptor. It has a specific shape, and that shape is specific to the protein of which it's going to alter its function. So there are many receptors that affiliate with membranes, and once the receptor ligand binding occurs, that changes the activity called cell signaling, somehow changes what's going on within the cell. And it's often a long cascade, in some cases, it's a very simple thing. So, anyway, that's another rule of. Of uh, membrane proteins. Another one is identity markers, and this is largely because of the calyx, we call it, the uh, oligosaccharides that bind outside these, and I'll talk about this in a second. But um, we have the capacity to uniquely label, just like in the dress, all the different cells, not only what's a liver cell and what's a kidney cell, but also, more specifically, we can label very carefully. Sounds like the scanning code in the grocery store. But we, the, because of identity markers on cells, somebody recognizes different families of cells from each other. Another thing which we're going to be talking about soon is we have to have a way to couple cells together. And there's a family of cadirins and enigrams and other proteins that couple and hold cells together in families. We're going to talk about that a little bit. And finally, over here, cytoskeletal. Uh, attachment sites. Uh, hopefully, in, in some of your courses up to now, you've learned about cytoskeleton, the fact that we're just not a bag of organelles, that the organelles are attached to this complex filament program or, or uh, structure within cells. We have uh, um, both contractile filaments, but we also have uh, filaments with remarkable tensile strength like collagen that form the cells into the patterns they are, and, and they have to attach to the membrane somewhere, so we have specific um, membrane proteins that are attached to sites or cytoskeletons. And not uh, picture that I thought I should at least add this, there's other functions of proteins which you're going to hear besides beads in the course. But anyway, the seventh on there is um, a signaling component. So this up here, I talked about signaling uh, right here with this ligand, but there is often, and almost always actually, right next door to that, another protein, and that protein doesn't couple to the ligand, but once the ligand couples with this, it starts another whole reaction, so I just call this intracellular signaling participant, but it's linked to it. it's part of the membrane structure, uh, but it doesn't couple to the ligand or anything else, it's just part of the cascade of signaling that occurs at uh, the proper time. So anyway, there's, there's all kinds of functions of these cool proteins in our membranes. Many of these proteins are far more than a single chain of amino acids, often we call them multimeric. There are several proteins working together as a family. And so in this particular illustration, I was trying to say that each of these colors is a different protein. They cluster together in a family to do, we sometimes call them uh, complex machines, molecular machines. In other words, you may put several of these polypeptides together in order to uh, have some very complex activity within the cell. Uh, and we'll talk about some of these functions as we move along to the class.
I keep mentioning these glycoproteins and I finally get to it. The surface, the external surface of all eukaryotic cells has this, we call it glycocalyx, this cluster of oligosaccharides, which is simply a chain of, of uh, monosaccharides, mostly glucose, that are coupled together in interesting different arrays and then coupled to the uh, proteins that are fully remembered. Some of, some of the oligosaccharides coupled to the uh, peripheral and some of the peripheral and some of the integral proteins and even some of them coupled to the uh, membrane backbone itself, the phospholipid. And these are branched, they're a very complicated uh, uh, organization and unique to a cell. So the idea is that each cell, as I said before, uh, can be recognized by the other cells of our body as part of the system. And some of these have the ability to be recognized as, for example, white cells go by in our bloodstream and they show this, expose this uh, uh, oligosaccharide and then the white cell or other cell will link to it. So it's a way that a recognized postal service can recognize the address of the cell on the sheet fly. Normally, they're enormously diverse and unique to every cell. Uh, they work in adhesion of cells during during development when cell types come together uh, and link. This is uh, largely due to this uh, glycocalyx. Blood clotting depends on it, and so does inflammation of types of interesting functions of the body. Okay, so that's my structural uh, quick introduction to cell membrane, and I hope to go right from there into. Uh, details about translocation biologically. Um, Warren Volpe in the second edition changed the book and, and added this little uh, page on remembering compartments before he started transport and I thought it was a good idea. What I used to do is just go right from here into what kind of, of uh, transport goes on where and so forth. But in my second semester I hope an hour actually maybe two on Fluid compartments are constituency and regulation. This is a cool story, but it's kind of bad to wait until the end of the class to start talking about our bodies dividing into compartments. So this, I agree with Lauren, we'll say this would be a nice thing to at least throw away with the introduction. So let me first explain why we talked about body fluid compartments and their boundaries, uh, and then you can see maybe some better reason for um, uh, having translocation systems. So when you're talking about just moving sodium one way, pass in another, and this compartment, this compartment. At least if you have a general idea of what we mean by compartments, it might make more sense. Um, one more little aside. My wife hates sport and bull tape. And the reason is the figures are all like this. They have way more information than you should have to know. So this is really just way too much stuff. But it's a nice figure to get the general idea of what I want to do. Uh, the average male weighs about 70 kilograms, and of that, 60% is water. So you and I are about 60% water, 60% is 17 kilograms, it's 42 kilograms. So we have about 42 liters of water. Uh, and it varies between day and day, and between men and women and with days. But very generally, we have about 60% water. We call that the total fluid volume. But the water isn't evenly distributed, there's boundaries. And so it's distributed in, first of all, inside and outside cells. So we can talk about intracellular fluid volume and extracellular fluid volume. And tremendously different in the constituency and different purposes and so forth. So first of all, intracellular fluid is about two-thirds of how much water you have in your body. So about 66% of the 42 liters or 25 liters is inside cells. So again, the majority of fluid in our body is inside cells, and about one third is outside cells, so you have 17 liters. First thing I don't like about this figure is it looks like two thirds of extra socket and one third is the way the artist drew it, but it's two thirds is inside cells and one third is outside cells. The fluid outside cells is subdivided into two compartments, and they're depicted here. This represents the fluid in the vasculature or the uh, plasma volume, since if it's inside cells, it would be intracellular. 
So the fluid that's vascular inside the blood vessels but outside cells is called plasma. And so the 17 liters, 3 liters, is in this compartment. And the rest, what's left of the fluid, is called the family interstitial. Uh, usually think of that as generally in your own mind as extracellular fluid that's not in the blood, interstitial. Uh, the fluid of the interstices, the species in between, the unpainted between, all kinds of terms for it. But anyway, that's the stuff that's between all the cells of your body. And they put it in the transcellular, the bone, type tissue. All I want you to know right now is that it's about 13 liters, 13, 14 liters, they have transcellular bone. But anyway, about 14 liters is interstitial, and about three that's flat. Don't memorize those numbers. I'll make you do it later. I just want you to know. Actually, by the time, if you don't tell people to memorize, by the time you get a run song, you need to know what they are. You know. So anyway, you guys have never asked a question that I have based on how specifically the size of it. I never ask those questions. But it's useful to know just generally the, the compartments and their approximate size. Uh, another huge table that I don't want to memorize, but you do have to know if you're going to get into this area at any, at any direction, um, just generally what's in the different compartments. And so I give you the principal differences, and that is the cations, often the electrolytes in your body, which largely exclude the sodium from inside cells and also calcium. Tremendous difference if you see between how much sodium is inside cells and out. Look at calcium, tremendous difference. There's very, very little calcium inside cells. That's critical for how cells work. Potassium is exactly the opposite. Most of the potassium is inside cells, as is magnesium. It's often affiliated with protein. The opposite for the anions, chloride is very high. Uh, again, outside cells, and bicarbonate 24 MEQ is very high outside cells. Most of the protein is in cells, and so is phosphate. So these are largely separated because of two things. So I have here on the bottom. Uh, these gradients have, uh, occur, and again, don't memorize it now, you can pick them up very soon. These gradients are established because of two interesting characteristics by the logical memories. One is that they're selectively referring to look like this. So they're very comfortable with some substances, they're not for and secondly, because we have an elaborate set of translocators. So those two characteristics make these constituent gradients uh, exist. Uh, one, they exist, they couldn't live. So these unique characteristics of the membrane establish these very different concentrations. Now, the next direction we're going to go is how solid how solute moves around fluid compartments in general, these are very important later on. And then we'll go into different mechanisms to get the body across the membrane. So the very simplest way you can look at how stuff moves around a solution is looking at gas in air, or gas in air. Looking at gas in space, how's that? Uh, diffusion of gases. So you all know that within this room surrounding us is a mixture of gases, nitrogen. And oxygen primarily. And the, they're not just sitting still and bouncing around the knee your head, hitting the clock and bouncing back, they're just bouncing around the room. And how fast they move is due to their kinetic energy. Or we essentially uh, come up with this equation um, to figure out the speed of a molecule in a gas mixture as its proportional temperature and inversely proportional square root of mass. So all that means is that the hotter it is in the room, the more fast so the molecules move, the heavier they are, just like in any, um, if you think of anything that's heavier, it's moving slower, and that's true of molecules in a solution. The heavier they are, the slower they move. And so you have molecules, and they have little mean free paths, we call them, how far they go before they have collisions, so they're colliding with those molecules, but they're essentially bouncing around in our space. So if you have a mixture of gas molecules with the same mass, so you have pure oxygen and nitrogen environment, and if this, the, this, the heat in that little chamber was constant and uniform, you'd have every molecule moving at the same space. So that little point is just that 
that's the only two things that determine the speed of molecules in a solution is temperature and their mass. So if they all have the same mass and the same temperature, they'll all be moving at the same velocity. So the simple point that turns out to be pretty important. Uh, as a scientist, we need to, in order to study the movement of solids first in the solution, then across the barrier, to have a way to measure. So we started out, flux is just a simple way of defining the movement of a molecule. How fast or what rate does the molecule move across the barrier? And that's, so essentially we have to, before we talk about translocation in, in very exacting points, we have to define a couple of terms, and one of those is flux. And flux is essentially how much of a given substance moves across a barrier, we can call it a plane or surface, per unit time, and also you have to know how much air is available in that area. So the units would be some amount, whether it be a milliequivalent or moles or osmoles, we'll talk about that in a second, how much time you're measuring it and what are what period, what area of what membrane you're looking at. The other thing about flux is it has this vector. In other words, is those molecules moving into the cell or out of the cell. All flux is measured in some direction, so we usually define a the direction is either uh, positive or negative, and it came up going into that stuff. So let's start out with the simplest of models. Let's imagine that we have a chamber, and the chamber is filled with gas. Which is a circle represents a gas molecule. And let's imagine that there's more of this gas on one side of the chamber than the other. And finally, let's imagine that we're going to look at the movement of it across some plane. So you have to put in some, in order to study flux, you have to have a barrier, an area across which the molecular species moves. So let's imagine there's a barrier as indicated by the dotted line. And then if you could measure the rate that these substrates move across this barrier, uh, the flux from A to B would be from here to here. And since there's more molecules in B than there is A, there's going to be two collisions molecules on the A side of this barrier than there is the B side. So you're going to have less molecules going from A to B at any one unit time than B to A because there's more opportunities on B to go across the barrier. So the flux from A to B, if you take the length of the arrow, is less than the flux from B to A. So the net flux, which is the sum of the constituent fluxes, would be from, first of all, B to A, but secondly, it would be the algebraic sum of those two component fluxes. So that's just kind of, you know, I'm not giving you numbers and the equation, but trying to give you some idea of what type of things we're thinking about with translocation. And so way back over a hundred years ago, a man, oh, here's my hand. Uh, I, I don't know, it seems like every year I'm trying a new approach and it didn't work this year. I don't know how this is going to come up in your uh, um, Computers that you're looking at, but in my computer, these look like equal signs. So the symbols of different programs use, unfortunately, for um, indicating parts of the equation often vary between with the, with the programmer's uh, joy. But anyway, so these candles are supposed to be equal signs. But flux, which we use J to symbolize, is, and, and you can see in that idiot line's already got differential equations up here. Uh, DSDT is just the amount for unit time. It's the slope of the curve if you're into calculus a little bit, but it's just the rate. You just stick with the rate. So the rate that substrate moves across that barrier, DSDT, the amount for unit time, is equal to, first of all, the diffusion is a, probably have these down below, yeah. Diffusion is simply the a constant representing how fast the molecule moves across that barrier. And the barrier can be nothing, you can do this in your imagination, but it's the rate of movement. And the only way you can determine it is experimentally. Uh, the area is how much area you would have available for movement, and DCDX is very important. It's the difference in concentration, and that's really what's responsible for this movement. So DCDX is a slope, essentially representing a gradual change in concentration from B to A. And essentially, if the diffusion constant, if the diffusion constant is constant, essentially, say, if the area is constant, 
what determines the flux is essentially the gradient and concentration. Very simple relationship. As we keep going, and it becomes quite important. Now, actually, this whole study of what we mean by flux and membrane translocation simplifies very easily when we leave a gas in a vacuum situation and move to a solute in a fluid. And it really simplifies it, even though it sounds like more complex. So let's look at flux in a biological system by at least considering. Uh, theoretically, uh, two aqueous veins are separated by cell membranes. Now, here's the same model, but let's imagine not gas molecules, but these are sodium ions or something like this, and chloride ions, separated by some barrier and the same solute on the other side. So we have two aqueous bases, A and B, and cell membrane. And it turns out this really simplifies things because. Almost all solute moves across a membrane barrier much, 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 much lower than it does through the through the uh, the fluid media on the side. And what that means is that you don't have to worry about a differential equation because there's no gradual concentration difference across the the model. You just have a high concentration on one side and low on the other. So by looking at a solute in a solvent system. You simplify things because you don't have to even have a differential equation. Uh, the high resistance really means that what happens now is, I said before, you have one concentration here and one concentration here, not as the gradient, because it takes so long for solute to move across the barrier that the sides equilibrate in concentration. Now I have books. <laughs> so, anyway, the flux is equal to the book is a negative sign. The purpose of the negative sign is to reinforce the idea that it's a vector. Negative means into or out, and so depends on the charge, unfortunately. I'll try and talk more precisely later, and you actually don't even have to know. But it just reinforces that it's unidirectional, that flux is one way or another. Again, I have the fusion of the constant there, which is an experiment area available, and DCDS. Now, this is essentially the trick equation. But this whole thing simplifies with the equal sign to the difference in concentration. This is C outside minus C inside. That's just the difference in concentration across the barrier. Dx is the distance the molecule travels, which is essentially the thickness of the membrane. My little equal sign can. So, anyway, I'm just saying that this whole thing simplifies tremendously. And so the flux across the membrane is really just proportional to the difference in concentration. This Equations of is in boron sulfate in your original area. So, really, maybe a little bit too much heavy to try and explain a very simple thing. And that is how much stuff solute crosses a barrier, like a membrane, is primarily proportional to the concentration difference. So, usually, it's just simply substance moving down their concentration gradient, kind of a take home method. But there's a little permeability factor here. And most of this has to be. Studying experimentally, and some of the factors that affect permeability are how soluble the molecule is, and primarily across the, the barrier. So, if it's something that's liquid soluble, it can evaporate across. If it's large and it's polar, it won't go across near as much. And that is described more specifically by a partition coefficient that I'll we'll talk about next. Uh, heavy molecules uh, move diffuse less rapidly than uh, light molecules for two reasons. I already talked about kinetic energy, so if it's heavier, it can move slower just in the solvent. But heavier molecules classically have a larger diameter, and largely because of size restrictions, they can't go through the body there, so that's another reason. And then the tremendously uh, strong effect of charge, uh, cations versus anions across the membrane. So permeability is affected by all types of things. Usually the measure, if we simply set up the experiment and measure, you can't really predict what that permeability factor would be. Let's talk about the partition coefficient for a second, just as simply as I can. If we want to find out how uh, hydrophilic versus lithophilic a molecule was, how polar molecule was, it's a very simple way of studying it, and we call it partition coefficient. So we take a Test tube, let's say, and put two mils of water 
and then two pounds of oil in it. And and as you know, they don't mix, so the oil um, front will stay on top of the water, so you'll have two two solutions essentially. You'll have water on the bottom and oil on the top. And then you pour a solute in, let's say you measure a certain weight of solute and you stir it up. And then you take off with a pesto like a or a separation pump or something, those two different solutions and measure how much solute's in each one. And so let's say you put four grams of solute into a 50-50 water solution and then you separate the two and you find out three grams is in oil and one gram is in water. The partition coefficient is the amount of oil versus the amount of water. So if you get a partition coefficient of three, that means very simple that the solute is three times more soluble in, in, uh, in water than in oil than it is in water. So it goes across the membrane pretty quick. So partition coefficient is essentially a measure of polarity of the solute. Okay, now I'm going to change again. So I have been talking about just really, really general uh, uh, factors that affect movement of solute in a solution and across a barrier. And now one of the first places to start from now is one of the most important biological constituents is water and talk about the movement of water across biological membranes. And this goes into the subject of osmosis and osmotic pressure, things that you heard about in all kinds of other classes. I'm always amazed that you don't remember these very well, but I, I found in the past it's useful at least to spend a few minutes uh, describing what we mean by osmosis. So let me remind you of a little experiment we did in high school, and that is if you call the pistol tube, you put a little solution, let's say 3% salt, and you tie it around the thing. We call it a semi-permeable membrane. It's also called a dialysis membrane. But you tie this across around the bottom of the inverted funnel, essentially, and put it in. And as you remember, water goes into the uh, pistol tube and raises the, the height of the column in that tube. And that's because of osmosis. Well, it's moving that concentration gradient, there's far more water in the beaker than there is because we displace some of the molecules with the salt. So the concentration of water is higher in the Beaker than it is in the thistle tube. Water goes down to concentration rate, and that process we call diffusion. I mean, osmosis. And that, that little slip is, is a significant slip. And that is essentially osmosis is water diffusion. But it's so important that we always talk about it in separate contexts because it plays a role in a tremendous number of processes that I'm going to be talking about all the way through the semester. Very simple concept. But it's involved in capillary filtration, and glomerular filtration, and multiple biological phenomena, tenacity of cells, etc. So, anyways, you should definitely be one of those little concepts you have in your journal uh, program. Okay, so the reason that water moves across the membrane is, first of all, it's far more permeable across membranes, plasma membranes, than any other substance. It has very high permeability and hence the water concentration is almost always equal between two compartments. There's a couple of really cool examples which we'll get into later. But otherwise, biologically, water is amazingly permeable across barriers. And the rate at which it travels is far faster than the other constituents. Uh, and that's largely you can think of it very simply. The water molecules have a very small diameter, so they get through these barriers very rapidly. Even though it's a little later, it, it gets across very, very quickly. Uh, and the rate at which it, it occurs is largely a result of the, the amount of particulate in the opposite chamber, which essentially means the water moving down its concentration gradient. And that point's made up right here. So this, the two different bubbles, if you will, represent two different molecular species. This would be sodium chloride, for example. And over here we have pure water, so there's more water per unit space on the left side and on the right, so essentially water moving that concentration gradient uh, from one chamber to the other. Very simple statement, but again, it's it maybe not intuitively obvious. If I were to ask you the concentration of water in a beaker, you usually think of something like, well, it's 2% sodium, it's uh, uh, 0.15 mole per sodium chloride, whatever, 
you're not telling me the water concentration, you're telling me the concentration of other constituents. We seldom express the water concentration of a solution. It's usually the constituent um, concentration. Uh, let's say you stop the rest stop on the turnpike on the way to Disney World, and some guy says, hey, buddy, calls you over to his car, look at you, opens up his trunk, and says, 55 mole of water. I'll tell it to you that's a thousand dollars a month. What's 55 mole of water? Well, that's what the real, super pure water it has nothing else in it, it's like 55 mole. So anyway, that we still don't think of water as a, uh, you know, how much it is per unit volume. But if you had pure water, it would have a higher concentration than anything else. But we even say don't express it that way. The way we usually express water concentration is in terms of osmoles. And it, it has value, although students have a hard time getting themselves around it. It's essentially a measure of how much water is there. Uh, and not how much constituents there. So an osmol is a solution that has one gram molecular weight solute. You looked it up on, on Wiki, but so I looked it up somewhere. It's how much solute there is per kilogram of, of water. And it's kilogram per osmol, wow, if you will, that is how it's essentially a thousand milliliters of water. Um, and the more solute you add, the more depressive we called collative properties, let me try and explain that. Properties of a solution, particularly water, that are changed by the amount of solute are called colligative properties. I didn't write it out there, but I think it doesn't make sense. Uh, so what does that mean? The more solute you have in a solution, one thing it changes is the freezing point. So as you add solute to water, and it has more and more particles in it, it's harder for that Solute to form a solid form as the temperature gets lower, so it's simple terms. Uh, if you're from the Midwest and, and you're up in Detroit, let's say, for example, and it's around 32 degrees and you don't want the roads to freeze, you throw salt all over, and it's good because you sell more cars that way. But anyway, the increase in salt particles uh, doesn't allow water to form a solidified as it hasn't, and we call it freezing point compression. So one way to measure how much solute's in the solution is to see what, how, what temperature it freezes at. And for every osmol particles in the water, it depresses the freezing point 1.86 degrees centigrade, which sounds like nothing, but it's a very measurable quantity. Other little, little properties, it raises the boiling point and raises the vapor pressure. So it's more, it's more difficult to boil and to vaporize fluid as solute has. So one way we have a measuring out of these with these fluid properties. Biologically, solutions are, are osmolality of our biological fluids are about 300 milliamps or 0.3 osmo. And it's very important and it does very, very much and if it does, serious. And when you talk about that all the way through the course and how we regulate it. To give you some idea of what, how Solute affects osmolality, you have this calculated view, and you, and you very simply, very quickly understand this idea as you move. So, let's say you put 180 grams of glucose in a liter volume metric, that's a one molar solution. 180 into is one mole, one molar per weight. So, 180 grams per liter divided by 180 is one molar glucose. And it's also equal to one osmolar. However, the J.5 sodium chloride, you know that that's the molecular weight of sodium, 23, 1235. So 58.5 grams of glucose in a liter is one molar sodium chloride. Uh, sodium chloride per liter is one molar sodium chloride, but it's two osmolar solution. And that's because this is a critical point, so you chloride associates nearly completely in a water solution. So you have uh, one molar sodium and one molar chloride. So it doesn't matter the classes of particles at all as far as osmolarity is concerned. You have two moles of particles, so we call it two osmolar. Very important little realization. 95 grams of milligram of magnesium chloride per liter is a one molar, but that associates with the three particles, so that's three osmolar. So anyway, you get the point that osmolarity is a function of the particular 
concentration of a solution and not the grams per liter or moles or whatever. So that plays a big role in some things we're going to in class today. And, and it's time to talk a little bit about osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure is the force exerted on a long container due to osmotic activity. Thank you. So if I have a piston here that's made up of a model and water on one side, the semi-permeable membrane, and water moves into a solution with a certain osmolarity, it'll force the piston to the left and you'll create what we call an osmotic pressure. So the pressure, the force exerted on the walls of this container by osmosis is called osmotic pressure. And Van Tant, um, a little over 100 years ago, figured out an equation to describe it. Van Tant's equation, and all we've mentioned it several times during this class, but it's how much pressure is exerted by a difference in osmolality. So this if high is often used for osmotic pressure. It's a symbol that we usually use. And is the number of particles or number of ionos, or however you want to think of it, as a molecule of sodium. So for sodium chloride, that would be two. For magnesium chloride, it would be three. So it's the number of dissociable particles. R is a gas constant, 0.082 liter atmospheres for all 30 degrees per Kelvin. And T is the temperature in Kelvin, 273 plus centigrade. And this is the difference in concentration, but it's in moles. If you have the concentration in osmos between two chambers, you don't need anos. And so anyway, if you put all those in, you can get the osmotic pressure exerted across a membrane by two solutions of different concentration, as I've done here. So just for example, sometimes if you think about how you apply these equations, it becomes more important. Uh, physiological salt solution is the solution that we can put in an IV and infuse it to a person and not affect their immunicity. We're going to talk about that very soon. So anyway, it's 0.15 molar, it's 300 million. 0.15 molar is going to So if you had 0.15 molar to put it on one side and pure water on the other, you could plug it in the equation, so it's associated in two particles, 0.082 times, let's say it's a biological temperature, it's 70 to 70, our body temperature, I should say. Uh, so that, and then times 0.15 is a molar difference. Uh, that number comes out to be 7.62 atmospheres of pressure. 760 million mercury per atmosphere gives you that 5796 million mercury, that's a tremendous amount of pressure. You can get from that that osmotic pressure is a significant phenomenon. A slight difference in concentration across the biological membrane creates huge differences in pressure, can cause lysis of cells, and all kinds of problems. So, anyway, and it's also one of the factors that affects capillary filtration and on and on and on. So, uh, we'll talk about this off and on, but you need to have a really good concept in your brain of what we mean by applying pressure and osmolality. Real quick. Uh, tonicity is uh, a measure of the, when you think of tone, muscle tone, you think of how, how, how stretched or full your muscles are, maybe, but it's a measure of the flexibility or the stretch of the tissue, if you will, tonicity. And in cell lines of reflection, the median concentration, I just kind of indicated the great pressure you could get across a member for the difference in osmolality. Well, that will affect the size of the cell, the cell volume. And I can give very specific examples of that right now. But normally our body fluids are 300 million. And at that concentration, it's the same as the intracellular concentration. So if you drop the cells in a 300 million molar uh, solution, you'd have the same amount of water going in as out. So you'd have no net flux, we could essentially say. And so it doesn't affect cell volume. We call that solution isotonic. That term iso, you remember it means same. And tonicity means you haven't affected the stretch of the size of the cell, so it has no influence on the size of the cell. So in, in humans, and on the same fish and some other organisms, uh, if you put those cells in traditionally osmoles, they won't affect the cell size. However, if the solution has a lower concentration, that's solute free in its time, Water, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so this is actually a greater, I'm reading my little symbol, greater than three.